Okay, um, I think we might be live. Uh, welcome to ATA's webinar on solar PV. Um, this webinar is one of a series of webinars that we're running um, that aim to um, continue the ATA's mission of sharing practical knowledge about energy efficiency, sustainable building and water conservation at home. Um, we're running it, these in a, obviously in an online format. Um, many of our members are actually rural based and there's lots of other people no doubt who are uh, dialing in to listen who will be located all over the country and this allows us to, to talk to uh, as many people as possible about different technology and sustainable practices across Australia. Um, all of our webinars will be recorded to form an archive for later viewing um, and they will be available on our website. And this series of webinars has been made possible with the support of Bank MECU, um, MECU, which we uh, are very pleased to work in partnership with. Um, my name's Damien Moyes. Um, I'm the Energy Policy Manager at ATA. And I also have Michael Harris with me. Um, and we'll be the, both the MC and the presenters for today's session. Um, Michael's actually a founding member of the ATA and a long, long time uh, volunteer technical specialist. Um, he's a pioneer of the uh, solar industry in Australia and is a uh, is the managing director of Enviro Group, which is a renewable energy energy efficiency uh, and sustainability assessment design company. Um, so what we're going to do is, is run through a couple of presentations. Michael's going to go first um, for about 20 minutes and he'll talk on uh, how solar PV actually works, what the technology is, what to look for when purchasing a system and dealing with installers. Um, and I'm going to do a presentation after that, more on the economics and the incentive side of um, investing uh, and setting up a solar PV system. Um, we'll have a, a short break in between. There's obviously the ability for people to uh, ask questions via the, the question box on the right hand side of the, the web page. Um, so people can post those questions and we'll try and run through those um, as in, in the break between the two presentations. Then we'll leave about 15, 20 minutes at the end of the session um, to, to run through quite a few questions and hopefully get through as many as we can. Um, so please keep them coming through. So on that note, uh, I think I might hand over to to Mick and uh, his presentation. Okay then, hello everyone. I hope you're having a nice day. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, good to be in touch with you. So we're talking about solar power and of course uh, a lot of you, I imagine some of you have got solar power, some of you are thinking of getting solar power and uh, you're interested in getting some useful information that helps you to make some decisions. So just the basics, first of all, solar panels are made of silicon, they produce electricity, They're, um, they are a wafers of silicon, they have PN junctions the same as you have in a, an integrated circuit or another electronic device. Just, just the obvious thing I will say first is they are different from solar water heating panels. Some people think that maybe that they're the same, you can use solar photovoltaic panels to produce, to produce hot water as well as electricity and you can't. Um, photovoltaic panels have silicon in them, solar hot water panels have pipes in them with hot water in them. So just a basic thing that you need to be aware of, you can't use them for the same thing. If you use a solar electric panel to produce hot water by heating an element, it's a very wasteful way to um, produce energy. So the next slide, um, just a little bit of background about how the systems go together. Photovoltaic panels are wired in strings, so if you've got five panels, you wire them together in a string, you wire one panel to the next panel to the next panel. Each panel is 24 volts. Um, if you wire five panels together, notionally you get about 120 volts, um, something like that. Uh, but typically these systems are wired together in strings to give you a higher voltage. So often the voltage you have over, uh, from a string of solar panels might be 150, 200 volts, sometimes more. Once you've got those wires, you, all those panels wired together, you often run them through an isolator switch for safety purposes. That's up on the roof, and then you run it down to the inverter. And once again, you go through an isolator switch, and uh, from there you uh, fed it into the inverter. The inverter turns the uh, voltage into 240 volts or thereabouts, 
and it gives you an IC uh, voltage as well, which can be fed directly into your house wiring. Now, you turn on your appliances when you're at home, you've got um, power from the sun, so you are basically using that power from your solar power system. If there's any surplus, so if there's any power you're not producing, that flows out into the local electricity grid, and you get paid for that in tariff, and Damien will be talking about that later. Um, now, there are a number of different types of solar panels. People often wonder what kind of solar panel should I actually use on my house. Um, the most commonly available are monosilicon solar panels. Um, so they create a big uh, silicon, a big uh, crystal of silicon, cut it, cut it up with a diamond saw in the factory, in the manufacturing plant. They diffuse a layer, some layers into the silicon to create a PN junction that's receptive to sunlight and um, there you are, you've got, a, you've got a silicon cell that works. Now, um, monocrystalline panels are quite efficient, they work quite well, and they are the most, most widely available panels. Uh, the next one is uh, polysilicon. Polysilicon is produced by a molten uh, quantity of silicon, except what they do is they have an ingot, so they have a, a, a metal vessel or a ceramic vessel, they pour molten silicon into that, they bring it up to the appropriate temperature, they let the um, crystals of silicon crystallise out and then you've got multiple crystals of silicon. So if you see a um, solar panel that has different colours in it, you know, different uh, shapes and colours, that's the polysilicon panel. Now polysilicon is not as efficient as monocrystalline panels, but it tends to not make any difference in the output of a panel. If you look at a normal panel like the one we had in the last image, you have a little diamond shaped, shaped uh, spaces in the corner. So what they'd taken was a round crystal of silicon, cut it up, um, they'd cut off the edges so they had a more or less rectangular shape, but there were little diamonds in the corner where there was a gap. Now with polysilicon, well, because they can make them to exactly the size and shape they want, often the cell's completely rectangular and there's no spare space. So even though you've got a less efficient cell, you've got more surface area, so you tend to get about the same power output. So People say, oh, poly's not as good because mono's more efficient. Well, in practice, they're both very good, and they both work very well. And I'd have no hesitance in, I wouldn't hesitate in using both mono or polycrystalline cells. Um, the other one is thin film. Now, thin film uh, panels are made by de vapor deposition onto a glass substrate generally. Sometimes they put them onto an aluminium substrate, which means they're flexible and you can bend them around. They're cheaper to produce, but they're only about half the efficiency of mono or polycrystalline. So it means that if you've got a 10 watt panel of poly or mono crystalline and a 10 watt panel of thin film, the 10 watt panel of thin film will tend to be double the size. Now, the, um, uh, the however, despite the fact that thin film are less efficient, they do have some particular strengths. They're very good in low light conditions. They tend to work better when they're very hot. Mono and polycrystalline panels lose performance as they get very hot. Thin film doesn't, they maintain performance. So um, three different types of panels. I would tend to not use thin film unless it's a special application because it just takes up a lot more room on my roof. Now, let's just talk about, we've talked about the panels, let's talk about some of the things that can go wrong. I know people watching this webinar are probably quite focused on I want to do something, I want to know what's the most, the best way to go, I want to know how to avoid traps, I want to get an efficient panel. So let's have a look at some of the things that can go wrong. There's a very dramatic photo, incidentally, on, up on the screen at the moment. It shows a panel that's um, cooked itself. Um, this is a very, very rare occurrence. I don't know that we have ever had this kind of problem in Australia, ever. And there's tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of systems installed. So don't look at this and get paranoid and worry. It's, uh, it's a dramatic illustration of what can go wrong, but it's also an incredibly rare illustration of what can go wrong. So um, what can go wrong if you're buying panels for yourself? Um, the wafers, lower quality wafers, are available out there on the market. You can buy cheap panels that use low quality wafers. One of the things that tends to happen with those is the power output of those systems uh, can tend to drop off quicker, whereas a good quality panel will tend to maintain its performance um, over the life and give you more power overall. 
wafer matching is another issue. You'll see some cheaper panels to sell the different colours, so the colours vary, and what can happen in those cheaper panels is sometimes the actual power output of the individual cells can vary more than it should. This can lead to hot spots on the panel, and one thing you can actually do, it's terribly, terribly, terribly keen, is you can get a thermal, uh, thermal camera, and you can look at a cheap panel and you can see spots which are a bit hot. And what can that result? That can result in, over the long term, the panel can start to break down, the hot spots can get worse, and eventually you can get panel failure. Um, the laminate, I've got my next door neighbour, got some cheap panels. His laminate, you can see they've gone off, they've gone to a kind of a brown colour, and that's because they're not properly UV stable. So the laminate is the white material you see at the back of the panel. From the front of the panel, you can see in the little diamond shape. The, um, the laminate there, or you can see between the cells. But um, that's something you have to be a little bit careful about. The cheaper panel sometimes will laminate isn't as good. Uh, diodes and other electrical components, cheap ones can fail. Uh, inverters, once again, the cheaper inverters are not, not likely to last as long. Um, one of the problems you have into the cheap inverters is they can have too few capacitors in the output stages. That means the capacitors run hot and they can eventually dry out and fail. It all gets back to quality. You know, if you buy or spend a little bit more, you're more likely to get good quality. Um, the installation of the arrays is, is an interesting issue. Now, the best way to place your solar panels is facing north. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means mm -hmm. latitude minus 10 degrees. So um, the, the thing is, the actual um, angle of the panel is not very critical. People often are thinking, what is the exact perfect degree that I need to have my panels on? And the fact is that if you have a variation in the, in the angle of your panels, it doesn't make very much difference at all. You know, you really 10, 15 degrees doesn't make a big difference because what happens is if your ang panels are angled a slightly steeper angle, you'll tend to get a bit better performance in the cooler months and um, you'll get a little bit less in the summer, in the middle of summer. So it's not a critical thing. Don't get your knickers in the knot about that one. Um, in practice, the best way to mount your panels with most roofs is just flat on the roof. Um, you don't need, as long as your roof is facing north, 20, between maybe 15 and 30 degrees, that'll be pretty okay. It's not really worth putting them on a frame. Um, you can face your panels east and west, but you will get a drop off in performance. The drop off in performance partly depends on how steep your roof is. A steeper roof will give you a bigger drop. A shallower roof, a flatter roof will give less of a drop off in power. But facing panels east and west is fine. You can do it, but just lose a bit of power. Um, one critical thing is, you can, is what do you do if you don't have enough room for all your panels on the north side? If you want to put some panels on the east or west, can you do that? The answer is yes, you can, but ideally you need to have two maximum power point trackers. The maximum power point track is for still gadgets inside the inverters that optimise the performance of the panels. And if you put some panels facing east, some panels facing north, you will find that the maximum power point track it does not work as efficiently and your system won't run as well. There are quite a few systems out there who, which have been done by cheap, cheap installers who really can do their homework. The systems still work, but they don't work as efficiently. Uh, let's keep going. Adding to systems, this is a question that also comes up quite often. Often people put in a small system and they want to add to add more panels to the system later. Um, there's been a lot of people who've got caught with this point because what's happened is people have put in, say, a um, 1.5 kilowatt system and a 3 kilowatt or a 4 kilowatt inverter. They come back to the suppliers and say, oh, we want to add some more panels now, and the suppliers aren't interested in them. They say, go away, uh, we can't do it. It's not easy. The problem is the panels have become more efficient over recent years. About three or four years ago, the maximum size panel was about 165 watts. Now they're sitting at more like 190 watts or 195 watts. So if you put in a system with 165 or 175 watts, and then you want to add some 190 watt panels later, there's a mismatch in the panels and they don't go together well. And it's not a good thing to do. And that gets back to where it's very good to have two maximum power point trackers. Um, so I think uh, basically what I've got on the screen is what I've already gone through. So just beware of the oversized inverter angle if you're being sold a system. Someone saying here will give you a five kilowatt inverter 
at 1.5 kilowatts of panels. The problem is the inverter will run at a lower efficiency, and for as long as you have that mismatch in your inverter and your panel size, your array size, you will have a lower efficiency system. And then, of course, there's that risk that you try to add more panels later and you can't get the same panels. So it's often better to either buy a, an inverter with, uh, if you want to add to your system, something with two maximum power point trackers, so you can load up one channel. It's like two channels in the stereo system. You can put a whole lot of panels on one side of the system first, one channel, load that up, that'll operate at maximum efficiency, you'll have a good system, then later you can add in 200 watt panels or some other wattage panels, and once again you maintain the efficiency of the system. It's a good way to go. Uh, batteries. People often ask the question, can I add batteries to my system? Um, and, um, you know, there's, you, you can, but there's a system with batteries is a different beast from a system with, um, without batteries. First of all, a, a grid connect system will operate at a higher voltage than a battery system. Typical battery bank voltage is a 24 or 48 volts and, um, so that, that's fine, the, back, the kind of panels we're talking about are 24 volt panels, but the thing is that um, if you wire up a grid connect system with 150, 200 volts, you can't just connect those up to the batteries. You've got to reconfigure the, the inverter so that you actually have, um, you actually have the, uh, the, the panels set up in such a way that they will feed through into the battery bank. So it means you need a different volt, so you've got to really rework your, um, the voltage of your, your panels so that they're appropriate to the battery bank. And then you've got the cost of the panels, you've got the cost of the regulator, you've got the cost of the separate inverter. So those all add up. So it is, it is possible to do this, and there are some systems that are designed from scratch to work this way, but it's not necessarily uh, an easy way to do it. Um, just, I thought I'd put a few figures in here because people often ask the question, now what's going to cost if I want to add batteries? Here's some rough figures, rough as guts. If you want to rewire your panels, you've got to get a sparky up on the roof to rewire them. And it might be half a day's work or two or three hours' work. How long is a piece of string? They can be any amount. Um, but you know, for a very, very baby system, you might do something for a few thousand. But really, you're probably realistic looking, looking at five to ten thousand for a battery bank. A new inverter, once again, maybe fifteen hundred to three thousand, and that'll still able to put it together. So you add that up, you could be looking at minimum five to ten thousand good batteries on a bridge bank system. Realistically, you could be looking more if it um, if you're looking at a bigger system. Uh, components. Now, people often worry about how do I get a good quality system? How do I make sure that um, I'm, uh, I don't get something that's rubbish or get something from a company that's not good? All of the brands that have been approved are on the CEC accreditation website, not the main CEC website, even though the CEC website does have links um, which will take you through the accreditation website. Uh, if you do go to look at inverters and panels, you will find they're actually virtually thousands of entries listed. There's a huge number. Some of the entries listed are not in the names of the brand that you may be being sold. So there may be a particular manufacturer who has got a brand uh, listed, but it might be that they've got a trading name for that brand. So sometimes the panels you are looking for won't be easy to find on the accreditation website. Um, there are a number of companies out there that are cheap companies that are not good and they don't even tell you what brands they're going to provide you. I would never buy from a company that is um, not going to specifically provide you with a particular brand. It's a dangerous thing to do. Never buy the cheapest. Look, the cheapest offers that are out there mean the companies are having to operate in the cheapest part of the market. That means they're buying the cheapest panels they can possibly find, the cheapest inverters they can find that comply with the regulations. Those brands are more likely to fail prematurely and the customer service it's likely to be worse from the cheapest companies, and the installers are likely to be being paid less, which means they're likely to spend less time doing a good job for you. Um, do a website check for brands. If you're looking at a solar panel and you think you're putting it on your house, just do a check and see if there's a website that comes up and looks decent. Um, the European and US products tend to have more consistent quality, but they don't any longer tend to be the best, best in terms of performance. 
the Chinese and the Japanese are starting to produce very good panels, and some of the best of the panels and inverters they produce are starting to outperform the US and the European brands. So Japanese product, uh, Chinese product can be okay, but it can also be um, substandard. So you just have to do your, your homework on those products. Um, Installers, um, how to get quality installers. There's two aspects to getting a solar panel. Good quality, and there's a company that is, is decent quality and will look after you as well. If you're buying from a company, check their history. How long have they been doing it? That a lot of companies are saying, we've been doing this for 10 years or a long time, but that means probably the, the guy who owns the company put a solar panel on his boat you know, 10 years ago. So he, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. In reality, a lot of companies haven't been doing it for very long. You need to find out about what their history is and you know, what they've done in the past. There was one company that went broke not long ago. They started off doing security systems. Then they went into solar. So if you can find out where they've come from and what they've done in the past, there are companies out there who are staffed and owned by used car salesmen. So you know, it would be interesting to know that, um, that information. So do a bit of homework. Um, avoid the cheapest installers. Uh, Google their name. This is when I say to people all the time, put in the name of the company and Google the word complaints or problems or go onto the online forums and you'll often find if they're a really bad company, there will be information out there that tells you that. If they're a recent player, there may not be any information, they still be there. So do other homework. If they've been around for a long time and there aren't complaints, it's a really good indicator that they're a good, reputable company. Um, there are some other good sources of information. Clean Energy, the Clean Energy Council Consumer Guide to Solar PV is a very useful document and it's available free on the website. The uh, Your Home Technical Manual is also a really good basic source of reference, also available for free. And there's also the ATA Solar Electricity Booklet which is available from the web shop. I think it's $10, uh, cheap price to pay if you're looking to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a solar power system. Um, so that's basically my presentation. Um, we could go to questions now, we could hold them to the end. Um, I'm happy to answer a few questions if people would like to like. Yeah, we, um, thanks Nick for that presentation. Um, and just quickly, apologies to anybody experiencing some of the audio issues there. If you did and you missed part of the presentation, um, uh, the, the, the copy of the presentation that will be online on the ATA website will be, will be fine um, in a couple of days' time, so please have a look at that. Um, there was one particular question that came up during your presentation, Mick, um, just on uh, standalone systems. I might just go back up and refer to it now. I might have a quick discussion on it. Um, so it was, what are the main specification or design issues? Oh, we just seem to have lost it again. Um, yeah, what are the main specification or design issues for a standalone PV system regarding charging the batteries of an electric vehicle? <laughs> nice complex one to start there. So you've got a solar power system and you want to charge an electric vehicle. Well, most electric vehicles come with 240 volt chargers, which means you can just plug them into an appropriate power point. might have to be a 15 amp power point because there's a bit of extra current involved. But really, there's no difference. Your solar power system is giving you 240 volt power and it's feeding it into your house. From there, it's going out very little really surface. If you want to charge on the vehicle, you just plug it in just like any other standard um, item that you want to run off the grid. And uh, unless you're uh, an ATA enthusiastic person who wants to directly run off the solar power system, really, it's as simple as that. Okay. A um, couple of other quick ones before we go to my presentation. Um, one gentleman here has been hearing of new panels with 40% efficiency. Are they a reality yet, Mick? Look, it's a fascinating thing. This one comes up all the time. It's been coming up for 30 years. And, you know, I'm kind of old and grey, and so I've heard it for so many times. There's always new developments coming out of the laboratory. There are always new products coming out. And the thing is, it's possible to measure um, efficiencies in the lab that don't translate to a good production model when you're actually producing the, bot the panels in, in mass production. And what has tended to happen with a lot of these new developments 
it's been difficult to turn them into mass-produced products. And if it has been, if it has looked like it's a probable thing or a possible thing to do that, the problem is that the cost of producing the higher efficiency panels is not viable. Um, there are high efficiency cells available at the moment, and the cost of them tends to be significantly higher than what you pay for the standard monocrystalline panels. The standard monocrystalline panels are so cheap now, it's incredible. Years ago they used to cost ten dollars a watt, now they're you know, not much over a dollar a watt. It's been a tenfold reduction in cost. There are high efficiency panels, and you know this could apply to the ones that the question's been asked about, um, even though I suspect they're still laboratory based panels. But the thing is that efficiency is not the golden cow, you know, it's not the golden boost or whatever you want to call it. Efficiency when the cost is excessive is not worthwhile. Um, really, it's a matter of what you can, getting the best value you can for your money, and as a result, um, uh, you know that's that's I think you know the critical thing you need to be looking for. Unless you are running say an electric vehicle, which we want to have solar panels on, where the efficiency is critical because of the amount of space involved. So yes, you know the, the new developments are coming, but in practice we are using technology now that is 30 or 40 years old. That is what's driving the industry. None of those new developments. Feeding through to the mass market now. None of them are going to be coming over the last 30 or 40 years. Okay, thanks for that, Nick. Um, a couple more quick ones before we go to my presentation. Um, there's been some questions around rebates and regulation, and I'll, I'll deal with a bit of that during my presentation shortly. Um, there's a question around standalone power system costs. Um, we just did a, a research study which people um, might want to refer to our ATA website to have a look at and we modelled the, the lifetime kind of system cost and the upfront uh, capital cost of, of a standalone system. Um, they were systems that had solar batteries and diesel generator backup systems or, or wind battery and, and diesel jet set backups. Um, they provided around 14 to 15 kilowatt hours a day for daily load requirement and started off at about $60,000 up front. So they're, they're not cheap to do, particularly probably for an, an urban situation. But um, we found that obviously it's, it's very much about your daily energy needs. And if you can be very efficient, possibly do a bit of fuel switching, um, you should be able to get that capital cost down a fair bit. Um, but particularly, I think, because of the batteries and other components, the standalone systems are still going to be uh, relatively expensive. Um, just one last one before we go to my presentation. There was a question there on the, I think the question was the difference between thin and, am and amorphous panels. Mick, do you want to handle that one? Sure. Now, um, I can't see the question there. Um, uh, the question that was further up in the list there, um, but I think it was the question the person was asking what's the difference between uh, yeah, difference between thin film and amorphous panels, um, almost the same thing? Yes. Um, look, thin film and amorphous are basically two names for the same thing. Um, amorphous panels are produced by vapour deposition and so are thin film panels. So you'll hear the different the terms used um, interchangeably, but they're basically the same thing. So. Yep, that's basically answered the question. There's nothing else else to it. Okay, then we'll go to my presentation, um, which will be about another uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll deal with a few more questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the economics and the current incentives that relate to, to investing in solar PV. And this whole area has changed a lot in the last, well, three to four years in my time working in this area anyway, um, and mainly on the back of uh, significant cost reductions of the technology over the last four or five years. So to start off with, why, why would you look to invest in, in solar PV? Um, obviously, the, the long-term reason for many, many people has been to to have renew to access renewable energy on, on site. Um, it's obviously a low, zero carbon emissions electricity source, um, the embodied energy paybacks these days on, on solar panel systems are typically within two years, I think, um, and these systems, provided you get a good quality one, is going to generate for, for 20, 25, 30 years. 
Um, so it's an excellent way and an increasingly good way of, of accessing renewable energy at home. Um, second point there, earning in income from a feed-in tariff. Well, feed-in tariffs around the country have been relatively high, sort of between 2008 and about 12 months ago. Um, but because of technology cost reductions um, and significant uptake volumes in some states, like New South Wales, um, feed-in tariffs have, have been reduced, and, and broadly, rightly so, from a policy perspective. Um, so perhaps earning income from, from feed-in tariffs, and we'll go through feed-in tariffs in a bit more detail, um, is, is a lesser reason. But where PV prices are getting to, really one of the, the main reasons that, that people are starting to look at PV now, particularly in the last 6 to 12 months, is avoiding uh, electricity price rises. Um, most states around Australia are facing pretty significant uh, increasing electricity costs. Um, a lot of this is on the back of significant network investment in the distribution and transmission lines, and PV has, has reduced in cost now to a point where the, the term grid parity comes into play. Um, now, grid parity is a, a fairly broad term. It's, it's um, defined differently by different people, but essentially, as we look at it, it's it's the, the average cost or the levelised cost of electricity over time, maybe over 15 or 20 or 25 years, um, from a from a solar PV system or any any piece of electricity generation technology, um, versus what is the cost over that time from electricity from the grid. Um, and given that, given that um, PV has has reduced its Substantially in the last four years now, in terms of its its overall uh, investment cost, um, we're seeing that. Looking forward now, from from 10 or 20 years in advance, we can see that uh, the cost of electricity from PV is matching, or even a little bit less than, depending on how you do the numbers, than than the cost of electricity from the grid. And uh, those electricity prices might might keep rising. Um, so we'll go through some of the specific incentives and the way that they work in terms of uh, providing an incentive to people to, to, to buy solar PV. Um, the first one, the, the upfront incentive, which has been around for a long time now, since about 1997, 98, um, are the small technology certificates, used to be called renewable energy certificates, that, um, that are awarded to lots of different types of renewable electricity generators, solar PV being one. Um, and those incentives, basically, you can create, particularly for small systems, less than 100 kilowatts of, of solar PV, you can create those certificates in advance of their 15-year uh, deemed generation, and those certificates can be traded through the market. That can be done by the, by the householder or by the person buying a system, but usually it's, it's done for you by the installer or supplier, like, like Nick through his business or many other businesses, and they'll discount the retail cost of the system by that. So generally, the, the the shelf price that you might see or talk to your installer or supplier about will include the value of those STCs discounted. Um, current value of those is around eight dollars in the market. The actual trading value of them is forty dollars um, at, at its at its highest level, um, but because of the way that the current market works and the fact that there are a lot of these STCs in play at the moment, um, but those prices are a little bit depressed, but um, uh, ultimately it does uh, give a reasonable upfront discount off the system price. Um, a couple of years ago, the government also, within this, this uh, renewable energy target policy, put in a multiplier to try and further incentivise people to invest in small solar PV systems, up to one and a half kilowatts in size. Um, originally, the multiplier was was five times, so you could create five times as many certificates um, as you normally otherwise would uh, for the first one and a half kilowatts. Currently, it's three for this financial year. It's been three, and this July, first of July, it will change, very likely to drop down from three to two. Um, and each multiplier level at the current certificate prices is worth about seven hundred to a thousand dollars for a one and a half kilowatt system. So we might see a bit of a price jump, maybe not totally by, by that amount, um, but we're likely to see a bit of a, a shelf price jump, I guess you'd say, um, once we move into the next financial year. So something to be aware of. 
Um, but at the same time, of course, you've got uh, solar PV prices continuing to fall uh, pretty rapidly. The other main incentive is, is feed-in tariffs. So feed-in tariffs is, is once you actually have the, um, the solar PV system up on the roof um, and it's actually grid connected and some of that electricity that it generates will be exported to the grid. Um, depending on the metering arrangement, it can be done in a way that all of the generation from the, the solar PV panel goes straight into the grid. Um, most states don't have that. New South Wales did, and the ACT did used to have a system like that. Um, most other states are, are net, what they call net-based systems, um, which is when essentially your, your PV system, the electricity from it, is, is actually used on the premises first and any, any electricity left over is actually exported into the grid and, and then export rates, the, the percentage of your, your generation that you export to the grid actually comes into play and that, that is based on really how, you, how and when you use electricity in the, in the home uh, or in, the, in the, the building that the PV is on. Um, so as we say, the majority of states have, have net feed-in tariffs now. Um, it, the feed-in tariffs in Australia have been a, a state-based policy so different state governments have done different things in this policy space pretty much since mid-2008 when the first um, premium feed-in tariffs came into play in South Australia and Queensland. Most of them have been reduced to some extent um, over the last couple of years and they even have different you know, scheme lengths. The, the original New South Wales one was a payment over seven years. The, the first Victorian one was a payment over... 15 years, um, so there's different design factors in, in feed-in tariff policy which it's, it's worth um, considering if you're looking to invest in a system. Um, this funny little graph is a little bit complex but it's, it's about looking at how a, um, for, for a net-based um, uh, solar PV system on a net-based feed-in tariff in terms of the way the electricity flows and the financial flows might, might work. Essentially the graph looks at, a, at um, um, a, across a day or you know, 3 a.m. to midnight. You're looking at those blue, the, the actual, the, the blue by power peaks is, is pretty much your morning and evening peak when you, your solar systems, generally speaking, not, not generate breakfast and, and dinner and into the evening. And so you, you're buying electricity at those times. During the day, though, up to sort of from you know 9 a.m. onwards, up until about maybe well, by the looks of that graph, uh, in the, the middle of summer, <laughs> you might still be generating a little bit after six o'clock. In, in winter time, it, it could be a bit earlier than that. Um, on a net-based arrangement, you're either going to be um, using that electricity from the solar PV system in the house, so it might be powering your fridge or powering computers that might be on during the day, um, and any export, any excess that, that's not being used in the house will go out into the grid, and it's only that excess amount that, that will actually warrant a, a fed in tariff credit. So if you're generating two kilowatts at any given time and you're using one of those kilowatts in the house and one of the, those kilowatts is going into the grid, then it's just that additional one kilowatt that will attract a fed in tariff credit at whatever price you might be getting, 10 cents, 30 cents, 60 cents, um, whatever it might be. Um, this is just a graph on, on where the state-based feed-in tariff arrangements are, are broadly at at the moment. Um, I'll run through them very, very quickly, but you can go to our website to, to get further information on this. Um, as I say, most, most states have now reduced their feed-in tariff incentives. Queensland is pretty much the only one which still has the original feed-in tariff from 2008 in place, which is a, uh, a legislated 44 cent per kilowatt hour rate on a net basis. Um, we understand that the retailers pay a little bit more, maybe six to eight cents above that as well. Um, New South Wales is in a, a state of uh, uncertainty on this front at the moment. The New South Wales government um, uh, got their regulator to undertake a review of what their future feed in tariff arrangements should be and, and that's, uh, that regulator came up with a recommendation of looking at about five to ten cents uh, on a net basis um, into the future. However, the New South Wales government hasn't made a decision on that yet. So at the moment, um, you have to really negotiate directly with your distributor to try and get a, a feed-in tariff for, for export. Um, Northern Territory, the Northern Territory, Tasmania, um, these, 
these both these states offer uh, what we sort of call one-to-one -one rates. They, they generally will, will offer you as a feed-in tariff rate around the same price that you're actually paying for electricity. So that might be around 20 cents a kilowatt hour, give or take. Um, Western Australia, uh, as we understand it, doesn't have a, a legislated rate at the moment, but you can get 8 to 10 cents or so um, uh, from, I think it's uh, Synergy, uh, might be the distributor over there. Um, 8 to 10 cents around that sort of a mark is broadly reflective of the, the average wholesale price of electricity. Um, and so that's why some of the, the some governments are looking at those sorts of rates. Um, South Australia has legislated a, a decent rate um, as a starting point and then also required the retailers to pay a little bit above that. In total it's about 25 cents or so a kilowatt hour at the moment until 2016 um, and then likely reduces down after that. Um, in Victoria we're currently going for a feed-in tariff review at the moment. Um, you can get for a, a small system under 5 kilowatts a 25 cent per kilowatt hour feed-in tariff rate, but that only lasts till 2016, uh, and we won't know what will happen after that until the review uh, actually, the government makes a decision after the re review is carried out this year. Um, there's also a standard feed-in tariff in Victoria that um, incentivises larger systems, up to 100 uh, kilowatt systems, both solar and wind, um, but generally if you've only got low export rates. Um, and the ACT, the last one there, um, is now, that used to have very strong uh, feed-in tariffs, particularly for small and medium-scale systems. There's still a medium-scale feed-in tariff there, but currently for small systems you have to negotiate directly with your uh, distributor. So, those two, the, the STCs and the feed-in tariffs are sort of the, the, the policy incentives that the, that the governments are currently using and have been using to try and get investment into, into solar PV. But we think the real incentive going forward from, you know, particularly over the last six to 12 months and, and going forward from here is really the fact that the base cost of solar PV has dropped by so much and the increasing electricity prices are going up by so much that um, solar is almost at the point of standing alone uh, economically as a, as a decision um, for, you know, for the longer term. Um, while some people maybe in New South Wales or elsewhere might have achieved pretty amazing payback times on their PV systems of only a, a few years, um, in, in no state are we kind of there at the moment and that's not necessarily um, the best way to incentivise what should be a, a long-term use of technology. But if, if you do take a longer-term view, um, solar is very economically attractive now comparing, compared to where grid costs are going. Um, this is just a graph on where PV prices have been. Um, when I broadly started in, in this role, um, we are looking at, at uh, installed prices of about uh, $14 um, a watt. Uh, or um, if we, uh, or about $14,000 a, a kilowatt. Um, we move forward five years to where we are now, we've seen about almost an 80% reduction in, in the base installed prices and these are before any incentives, before any STCs are, are put into the mix. Um, and so we're looking at even good quality systems now for close to $3 a watt installed uh, before incentives which is, which is pretty good for the consumer. Um, so PVs, it's no longer what we'd call a significant household purchase. You know, when, if you're looking at making a, a ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollar purchase, it's a pretty, pretty con considerable um, investment to make. We're now seeing, you know, solar PV systems put on credit cards and is almost a disposable income level. Um, but in that context, though, in that context, though, the, the key thing that we'd still be pushing consumers to think about is the fact that. You know, solar is, it still should be thought of as a long-term investment. It's a system that you want to be generating on, on your house for many years to come. Um, you want to use it uh, potentially to, to manage your electricity costs over time. And so therefore, you, you actually want to in, ensure that you get a reasonable quality system. And, and Nick's gone through on, a, on the technology side what a quality system means. Um, I'm just going to talk quickly about on the warranty side what you should be looking for which will give you a reasonable guide um, to, to in getting a quality system. Um, the, the context is, of course, that w with solar PV prices dropping and feed-in tariff rates being 
relatively good for a while. You know, the, the solar PV market in Australia has exploded over the last uh, particularly two to three years now. And there are, as Nick was saying before, a lot of new installers, um, and you need to know, you know, how long have some of these been in business? Um, are they willing to stand by their products? Most of the components within the systems uh, are imported and not actually manufactured in Australia. So how do the warranties work on that basis? Um, and generally speaking, the three warranty levels that you, you want to be looking at um, is a, a performance warranty on, on the panels itself. Most reasonable quality systems now will give you a 25-year performance warranty. It will define a level of, of generation output in that 25th year, might be something around 80%, um, and they might give you a, a, a mid-range benchmark after, say, 10 or 15 years of around 90%. Um, inverters is generally a product warranty, generally for failure, um, can be as low as one year, can be up to 10 um, we'd be encouraging consumers to strongly look at inverters with a much closer warranty towards 10 years. Um, and the third, I guess, main tranche of the warranties is the installation warranty. This can be pretty key. A lot of businesses we think now have picked up on this, but given that the, the panels particularly and even the inverters can be imported, um, the installation warranty might be the only warranty that actually sits with the local installer. And so you just want to know that firstly that the, the local supplier that you're dealing with is going to be able to honour the warranties to do with the panels and the inverter and that you want to get a reasonable wa warranty for workmanship as well. Um, many of these, we've seen them from again from one year, we've seen them for, for 20 years, um, which sort of suggests that looking around at least four to five years should be a, give you a reasonable chance to ensure you get to a quality system. Um, if you are looking at the economics overall of systems, um, I mean the economics payback times, this is you know a fairly fluid concept and depends on all the different assumptions that you want to bring into the equation and how you use energy, house, energy in the house and, and your bills and so forth. Um, we try and do these just to give consumers a bit of a guide to how the economics works in, in the latest issue of Sanctuary. We've done a, a bit of a payback model on, on two kilowatt systems around, around the country, which is relatively reasonable of where good quality system prices are at, at the moment. I mean, given that we put these numbers together probably three months or four months ago now, they might have reduced a little bit, but it's a reasonable guide. Um, so we'd refer you to that, and there's other information on our website too about the, the economics as well. Um, so I think that's it for my presentation. So we've got about uh, 12 minutes left um, and so we might go back to a few questions. Um, and I'll try and try and f go back up the top here and see what we had by way of questions. Um, Lots of discussion on the on the web here about I think around the New South Wales um, fed in tariff. Um, there, there's one point here about um, uh, a gentleman's posted about the the previous the original 60 cent fed in tariff in New South Wales. Does anyone know when the the date of this will will expire? Um, the, the 60 cents in New South Wales started on the 1st of January 2010. Um, and it was a seven-year system um, scheme originally. So uh, on that basis, if you made it into that first 300 megawatts or so that was installed, um, then you, you should be able to keep getting that fed in tariff until 2017. But um, that was the, the 60 cents was closed to, to new entrants, um, I think probably well over a year ago now. Um, uh, lots of discussion on, on gross and net. The, the, the ACT and the, the New South Wales feed-in tariffs originally were, were gross feed-in tariffs, so that the way the, the metering arrangement worked was that it, they used twin element meters and all of the electricity from the, the PV system went into the grid and you basically were credited a feed-in tariff for all of that electricity. Um, once with, with premium uh, feed-in tariff incentives like that reducing, um, and perhaps only smaller feed-in tariffs like 8 to 10 cents or whatever the say the New South Wales government comes up with, the, probably the larger benefit to you as a householder is going to be what the, the price of electricity that you're avoiding by using solar electricity in the house. And on that basis, you actually need to be on a, a net arrangement in order to, 
to actually use that electricity um, uh, in the home and, and, and make the economics of that, uh, that system work. Um, question here, um, what happens to guaranteed high feed-in tariff if you augment your system from one and a half kilowatts to four kilowatts in Victoria? Um, as we understand it, if you had a, a, an original system, one and a half kilowatts or whatever it might have been, and you, you originally got the 60 cent uh, feed-in tariff in Victoria, and you increase that system size, um, that you won't any longer be eligible for the 60 cent feed-in tariff, and you might actually be changed over to whatever the current feed-in tariff arrangement is, which currently in Victoria for a system less than 5 kilowatts is, is uh, 25 cents a kilowatt hour. Is that your understanding of the arrangement in Victoria, Mick? <coughs> yes, it is. I'm not sure I'm coming through at the moment. Um, but yes, that's my understanding. Okay. Um, another one here. How do you calculate the number of STCs you can get? Um, I mean, this is done uh, automatically, but if you are interested in the, the mathematical side of it, um, the STCs are awarded in zones across Australia. There's, there's four zones, um, and <coughs> zone, zone one is essentially up in the northern parts of Australia, and there's a, there's a calculation um, rate which is based on the, the solar insulation levels and the conversion into electricity from a solar PV system. It's a conservative factor that's used, um, and that factor is higher obviously in the, in the northern zones compared to the southern zones. So zone one is, is based up in the northern parts of Queensland and Darwin and the northern parts of the Northern Territory. Um, you know, Melbourne and Hobart and the rest of Tassie are, are located in zone four and have a lower uh, STC factor applied to them. So you have to take that and then you, you apply it by, a, by the uh, deeming period, which is 15 years and you also need to put in the, the multiplier there as well. Um, the Office of the Renewable Energy Regulator, which is just actually, which is the regulator for the renewable energy target market, um, who've just actually changed names, and for the moment their name escapes me, um, but if you go to their website, they have all the calculations that you would need if you wanted to go through that exercise yourself, but talking to a, a solar installer, um, will they'll be able to help you work out what how many, firstly, how many certificates your system is eligible for and uh, what the value of those might be. Ah, I've just got a post here. It's the Clean Energy Regulator. That's the new name of the old Office of the uh, Renewable Energy Regulator. Um, uh, out of curiosity, what is ATA's position on the appropriate feed-in tariff pricing net or growth? Um, as I say, given where both solar prices and electricity prices are going, we, we think a, a net-based scheme is, is pretty reasonable, much more reasonable for a householder than, than perhaps three or four years ago, given that part of the, the economic attractiveness of buying PV at the moment is to avoid um, uh, grid prices, uh, grid, grid electricity prices. Um, as to what the rate should be of that, um, th there's different ways that you can look at that policy approach. We've done a, a recent submission to the Victorian government on what we think, how we think that the feed-in tariff should be designed for Victoria, and that that detailed submissions on our on the ATA website as well. So I'd refer people to that. Um, Um, now, there's a question here about the payback period was in dollar terms, but can that be put into carbon terms, into emissions terms that are saved from going into the atmosphere? That, that's a bit of a different um, equation, a bit of a different question to ask. Um, the, the way to do that is to look at essentially the, and there's emissions factors by state in Australia, uh, and Victoria has the worst uh, emissions factor. It's a, it's basically an output of, of carbon dioxide equivalent gases per megawatt hour of electricity generated by all the generation, including the big coal and gas and other plants in the state, given Victoria's reliance on 
coal fire generation. Um, it, Victoria has the, the worst or most emissions intensive uh, emissions factor of all the states in Australia. Um, so to, to do that, you would need to work out um, whichever state you're in, how much generation you're like to, likely to generate from your PV system, say, in a year, and then um, calculate that against the, the emissions factor in your state. Um, that's not necessarily a payback um, question. If you're looking for embodied energy payback, then um, most of those most of the systems these days, I think, make a rated on embodied energy paybacks, um, and are less, I think, than, than two years now for most systems. Is that right? Yep. Um, so you can probably talk to your installer about that one as well. Um, solar panels on the ground, are there advantages? Mick, did you want to talk to this one? Okay, we'll swap headsets. So, um, yeah, if your panels are on the ground, you will tend to have more circulation around them, and you'll tend to they'll tend to run cooler, and so they will tend to give you more power. But any decent system that's mounted on a roof should have a gap underneath it of 100 mils, something like that. Um, so, you know, the the thing is that you know really keeping your panels cool. So ground mount's fine. You know, it's good to ground mount solar panels and you'll get slightly better performance. The other thing is if you actually have solar panels on a frame, so they're on a flat roof and on a frame, those panels will tend to perform better as well. Okay, thanks Nick. Um, another question about um, what impact will the carbon tax have on the purchase price of solar PV systems? Um, the short answer is essentially no impact, none. <laughs> the, the carbon price essentially um, regulates or places a cost on on um, companies, businesses, activities that, that basically pollute uh, carbon dioxide equivalent gases. Um, solar PV um, is not, or solar PV businesses are, n are not a technology or a business that is regulated in that way by the carbon tax. What, what the carbon tax does is it makes electricity from more emissions intensive sources such as uh, coal or gas fired electricity plants, it makes that electricity more expensive, which then closes the gap between the cost of electricity from those sources and the cost of electricity from re renewable sources and starts to actually uh, level the playing field um, in that sense. Um, I think we're probably, we've got about uh, two minutes left, so we might leave it there. Um, Yeah, we might leave it there in terms of questions. Um, actually, we've got a couple more coming in now. Oh, I, we'll, uh, no, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there for the moment, I think. Um, if people do have more questions and issues they want to discuss, the, the ATA web forums are, are a great source of different uh, topics and, and discussion on these issues, so we'd, we'd definitely point you towards that. Um, but otherwise, um, I'd just like to thank people for um, for dialing in today and listening to our webinars. We do apologise for the little bit of audio technical issues we were having. Um, we would like to particularly thank uh, our um, our partners and, and um, uh, funders for this session, who is, is Bank MECU. Thank you very much to them, and we hope to run more of these sessions with, with Bank MECU in, in the short term. Um, if you are looking for more information on solar PV, particularly um, in the current issue of Sanctuary and particularly in, re in Renew uh, issue 118, um, there's a solar PV buyer's guide in that. Most of the, the Renew and, and Sanctuary uh, magazines have different uh, articles on various aspects of solar PV, so we'd, we'd encourage you to have a look at those. Um, I'd like to thank Mick for your presentation today and your comments. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, of course, thank you, the audience. Thanks for your questions. Um, I hope we got to uh, a reasonable number of them. As I say, if, if there's things that are outstanding you're not sure about, you can contact us or, or go to our website. 
Um, and just a final reminder that the webinar today has been recorded um, and uh, will be available for viewing via the ATA website in a couple of days' time. And um, it, the, the audio issues that uh, we experienced during the, the presentation shouldn't be a problem in, in looking at that again. So thanks very much and we'll, we'll see you next time.